Welcome to another electronics on the floor. Last time it was variable resistors, this time it's variable capacitors. I'll go through my junk box and explain the various types of variable capacitors you might encounter and their uses for radio projects. Variable capacitors are increasingly rare in radio equipment that you see these days. One possibility is to look for them. Consider things like ham radio junk sales, deceased estates, ham fests or even eBay. The other thing is any time you see an old style transistor radio in a second hand shop, garage sale or even in a council clean up on the street, grab it. There will usually be one suitable variable capacitor and if you're lucky some form of dial reduction such as a dial cord and pointer. Test equipments become increasingly cheap and some of the functions that you can get include capacitance. You need something that can measure down to a few picofarad, up to about a thousand picofarad. That will cover the range of most variable capacitors. Keep your lead short and then clip them onto the variable capacitor, usually connecting to the moving plates and the steel plates. As you turn the variable capacitor you'll be able to see the range that it covers. With practice, you'll be able to look at a variable capacitor and estimate what value it is. Remember, the larger the plates and the closer they are, the higher the capacitance. The smaller the plates and the further apart they are, the lower the capacitance. This is a common transistor radio type variable capacitor. You can still find them available from suppliers like JCAR. The middle pin is common, while the bottom pin is normally the higher value of capacitor, normally about 160 picofarad, and this pin is the lower one, normally about 60 picofarad maximum. There are trimmer capacitors on the back which you can use to slightly vary those ranges. If you want a higher capacitance value, like say 220 picofarad, then just bridge the two outer terminals. That puts the two capacitors in parallel and increases the value to that which is the combined sum of one capacitor plus the other. You have to be a bit careful with the little screws. Don't screw them in too tight otherwise you'll hit up against the plastic plates and possibly damage the capacitor. A capacitor like this isn't as stable as a metal gained tuning capacitor. Also their RF power handling rating isn't very high. Nevertheless, it can still be useful for QRP antenna couplers. They can handle up to about 5 watts. If you're lucky, the capacitor you buy will come with a small screw and knob. This is something you might find at a ham fest. It's wider spaced than the normal variable capacitor you might find in a valve radio. I'd estimate its maximum value is around 50 or 100 picofarads. Minimum value may be around 5 or 10. The frame is connected to the rotor and the stator plates are insulated from the frame. Minimum capacitance is when the plates are not overlapping. Maximum capacitance is when they are fully overlapping. Because these plates are semicircular and there's no cutouts, then a setting like this is exactly 50% of what it is like this. This is a two gang variable capacitor. Another thing about it is that the turning of the plates is slower than the knob that I'm turning. That's because there's also some mechanical reduction which makes tuning easier. If we have a look here you can see that the knob is attached to a small gear while the plates are attached to a bigger gear. It's a little bit hard to see until I turn it but you'll notice there's a slight difference in the plates. These plates are all continuous while there's a gap here. That gap means that this gang has a slightly lower capacitance than this gang. An application for this might be if you've got a receiver where you're using the one capacitor that's controlling both the local oscillator and the front end. Because they're on slightly different frequencies, normally separated by the intermediate frequency, the capacitance values are also slightly different. Getting them to track at all parts of the dial is a real design challenge and one I won't go into here. If you want a particularly high value of variable capacitor then just join the two gangs together. That will double the capacitance. 
that's particularly useful on the lower HF bands for projects such as antenna couplers. An airspace capacitor like this should be okay for 50 or maybe even 100 watts in an antenna coupler. Here's another two gang variable capacitor which at first sight looks very similar to the one we saw before. It's even got a vernier reduction drive. The big difference though is that these two gangs are identical. That's really useful for certain applications. For instance, in the front end of a receiver, if you want to make it tight and reject out of band signals, then you need two, or preferably three, tuned circuit sections near the antenna, or either side of the RF preamp. In that case, you'll be using banks of identical capacitor and coil values. Having a very tight selective front end reduces cross-modulation and ensures that your receiver is not affected by very strong signals on other frequencies. Modern cost cutting has reduced the tendency to use this approach, but it's still technically valid and capable of extremely good performance. Now here's another variable capacitor, just a single gang type. It's much smaller than the others I've looked at. It's probably only maybe 30 or maybe even 50 picofarad maximum capacitance. You might use this as a VFO that doesn't need to cover a very wide tuning range or even as a tuning control on a linear amplifier on say the higher HF bands or even maybe on 6 meters. Again the knob is usually connected to earth or chassis and the stator or the fixed plates are connected to your live terminal. Mounting is easy using a similar sized hole in the front panel to that of most potentiometers. This is another two gang variable capacitor. Note the wide plate spacing, making it useful for high power RF amplifier circuits. Although six meter operators tend not to use antenna couplers, something like this would be a useful capacitor to use if you're building one. It might even be good enough for 10 meters, especially if you connected the plates together to make a single capacitor of doubled value. While not a variable capacitor, this little item here is really useful. It's called a flexible coupler. It's particularly useful in variable frequency oscillator circuits because for good stability, you want both electrical and mechanical isolation. That means when you adjust the tuning, the tuning capacitor plates do not vibrate. Something like this provides some mechanical isolation. It also allows a capacitor's shaft to be extended, which may be useful if the capacitor is mounted far from the front panel. Not unrelated to the two gang variable capacitor is something like this, which is called a butterfly variable capacitor. There's one connection here for the rotor, which is common, and two banks of stator plates. This may be useful for certain circuits, for instance, VHF linear amplifiers. Something like this is quite a small value. It might be only 20 or 30 picofarad. You might use something like this for VHF circuitry. It's actually a preset type capacitor with a screwdriver used to adjust it. Here's something that's quite rare, a three gang variable capacitor. This would be useful in an HF receiver project. It would be ideal for a pre-selector or front end. The more tuned circuits you have, the better the rejection of signals away from that which you're trying to receive. Here's another single gang variable capacitor. Not only does it have a reduction drive, but also a dial. It would be ideal for use in a regenerative or other simple receiver. In that, it could either be the tuning control or regeneration control, with the reduction providing easier adjustments. Here's another hefty one with a maximum value of probably around 150 to 250 picofarads. Its plate spacing is somewhat wider than you'd find in one from a valve radio. Something like this would be perfect for an HF antenna coupler or ATU as some people call them. Now we'll look at trimmers. Trimmers are variable capacitors that once you've adjusted a value you generally don't need to touch it again. Therefore, adjustment is normally with a screwdriver. Here's a particularly useful type of trimmer capacitor. It's called a mica compression trimmer. The tighter you screw it in, the tighter the mica fits against the metal plates and the higher the capacitance. 
you might even get capacitance as high as 500 or even a thousand picofarads with something like this. They can also withstand quite high voltages, making them ideal for use in transmitter amplifiers and the like. If you're building a monoband transmitter power amplifier stage, then something like this may be ideal. Here's a type of capacitor called a beehive trimmer. This particular one, which is the most common type, has a maximum capacitance of 25 picofarad when it's fully screwed in. And when it's screwed out, it's probably 5 picofarad or less. As you can see, I just undo the top and this is what it looks like inside. These were used commonly in a lot of VHF transceivers. They were useful in narrowband VHF power amplifiers and I've also found them useful in magnetic loops. They've got quite a good voltage rating and they are easy to adjust even just with your fingers without needing a screwdriver. Ones that are twice as tall normally have a maximum capacitance value of 50 picofarads, which can be useful in some circumstances, such as with magnetic loop antennas. Not a capacitor, but this is something I got from a hardware shop. It's got a thread to accept a screw, and it's a bit of rubber, and the significance of that here is that you can fit them on a beehive trimmer, and you can adjust it without touching the metal. That could be useful for some applications like magnetic loop antennas. Another trimmer, basically a miniature type of variable capacitor. This one has two pins that can be inserted in a printed circuit board. A screwdriver on this slot allows its capacitance to be varied. Maybe a maximum of 10 or 20 picofarads for something like this. Now trimmers can be incredibly small. These are some that were recently got off eBay. They have different colours which I think reflects their capacitance range. This one goes up to 40 picofarad. The minimum capacitance of these would be something like 5 or 10. Um, you have to be a bit careful with them. You can overheat them with a soldering iron and also if you twiddle them too much with a screwdriver then you can also mangle things. So be a bit careful with these and don't apply too much heat. But they're cheap, you can buy them and they're quite good for low power VHF and HF projects. For instance, if you're building a receiver front end and you're happy just for it to be on one band, then a trimmer like this can be fine. You don't need a variable capacitor on the front panel, as the front end tuned circuit will normally cover an amateur band OK. This is also from a piece of VHF radio equipment. I would say its maximum capacitance would be quite low, maybe up to 10 picofarads and there's quite a small inductance in parallel. Something like this would be okay for, I'd say, the VHF high band, maybe even two meters. This is not a variable capacitor at all. It's called a feed-through capacitor, and this can be useful if you're building a piece of equipment that needs to be electrically isolated. You'll typically build it in a metal box, either a die-cast aluminium box, or even something made out of printed circuit board, and you might use the feed-through capacitor to pass power connections through. Another compression trimmer. Again, they're very useful. If you see them, don't throw them out. Here's a bank of four trimmer capacitors. Something like this could be useful in a multiband receiver or similar. Another trimmer capacitor assembly. Probably salvaged from an old receiver. Three all in a row. They are independent, so you could connect it maybe for a multiband receiver. Another compression trimmer. They've been very considerate and marked the value 12 to 120 picofarad. Most of the time, though, they don't mark the value, and that's why some sort of capacitance tester is very useful. If your attempts at getting variable capacitors have failed, consider other options, depending on which part of the circuit it's in. If it's for a variable frequency oscillator, you can use a DDS frequency synthesizer, which will probably be more stable as well. Another possibility is to make your own variable capacitor. Remember, all a capacitor is, is two metal plates. If you can vary the overlap or the spacing between them, then you vary the capacitance, and so you have a variable capacitor.
Some magnetic loop antennas also feature homebrew variable capacitors and people have used even things like coke cans overlapping to provide the capacitance. Another possibility is instead of having a variable capacitor and fixed inductor, have a variable inductor and fixed capacitance. That could work with some variable frequency oscillators. That's called a permeability tuned oscillator. Some of the old car radios from 30 or 40 years ago use that technique in order to change the receiver's frequency. Another possibility is a Veractor diode, which I've mentioned in previous videos. Have the diode where the variable capacitor is and vary the DC voltage on it. The capacitance of the diode will vary and you'll be able to change the frequency. Note though, you won't have as big a tuning range as you would with a variable capacitor and your voltage needs to be well regulated in order to ensure reasonable frequency stability. Even if you don't have Veractor diodes, you can use other types of diodes, such as power diodes. You can even have several in parallel to get a higher capacitance. If you want more capacitance, just put more diodes in parallel. Less capacitance, just have the one diode. This has been our look at variable capacitors. They're increasingly rare, so if you see one, make sure you snap it up. If you still can't find them, I've given some substitutes you can try instead.